uh, just to remind everybody, the Q&A will be at the end of the session. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Dan Earl from Solaris. Uh, Dan, in the last year or so, has left the, uh, the dark art of investment banking and his chosen horse has been Solaris and the Orinsa project in Ecuador. Dan, thank you for your time. I know that you're crossing time zones uh, today, marketing in Asia and now in North American time zones. So thank you. I look forward to hearing about Solaris. Well, thanks so much. It's really a pleasure and an honor even to, uh, to be here today sharing this story with you. Uh, so yeah, as you mentioned, Daniel Earl, I'm the president and CEO of uh, Solaris Resources. This I describe as being a, a copper gold growth and discovery story. It was spun out of Equinox Gold in, in mid-2018. And what Equinox did is they partnered with the Augusta Group to surface the value in what they conceived of as a copper exploration portfolio. We now describe it as having a gold dimension uh, based on some of the more recent information that, that came in. Augusta, if you're not aware, has a totally unrivaled track record of value creation in specifically this niche of exploration and development in the mining sector. So that total is over four and a half billion dollars of exit transactions over the last decade. So Augusta Group manages this company through Richard Warwick, our executive chairman, being the principal of the Augusta Group. We have strategic backing as well from Equinox Gold and then Ross Beatty with a private investment alongside Equinox Gold. And in addition to that, Lucas Lundin, which is particularly important to us in Ecuador. But between these individuals, Richard Wark, Ross Beatty, Lucas Lundin, you have billions of dollars of shareholder value creation over the course of their careers. And certainly we're looking to continue adding to that total here with Solaris. The other important aspect is honoring the legacy of David Lowell, who unfortunately passed away uh, just recently in May, which was a big blow to us on a personal level. Uh, David, of course, the world's greatest explorer who co-defined the porphyry copper model for the first time back in the 60s, and then went on to make over a dozen major discoveries, including the greatest porphyry deposit of them all, Las Candida, which is now the world's largest copper mine, more than twice the size of the next largest copper mine. So our flagship project, Warinsa, this was his discovery in Ecuador uh, in the early 2000s. And so the job that we have to do is we've got to bring the Warinsa central resource, which he got started. That's essentially his drilling. We've got to fully drill that out and bring it to its potential and indeed make the rest of the discoveries that there are to be made on the Warinsa porphyry trend and then surface some of this gold potential, which I, I, I spoke about as well. And then in addition to that, beyond Warinsa, we're not gonna talk about it today, but we do have a large portfolio of grassroots exploration projects that were hand selected by David, uh, the exploration programs conceived of by David. These are David's targets uh, for future discoveries. And so in all of these ways, this is how we're going to honor the legacy of David Lowell and write a, a fitting epilogue to his legendary career. Uh, Forward-looking statements. A picture of Warinsa here. So this is the Warinsa Central Zone. The three holes that we've announced to date, they were all collared at 1,570 meters of elevation. The peak of the ridgeline that you see there is sitting at about 1,660 meters, so about 100 meters uh, above uh, where we're drilling. Obviously quite steep topography. This prevents a challenge during the exploration phase, but it's going to prevent much greater benefits when this project eventually gets into the mining phase in terms of reducing the strip ratio with this topography, gravity, gravity assisted haulage and all the rest of it. In terms of where we're located, we're in southeastern Ecuador. This is uh, this project's within Morona Santiago province. We've got a volcanic belt that's run, running roughly north-south, uh, which hosts the major deposits. Immediately to the south of us in Zamora Chinchipe, you have uh, Fruta del Norte, and then to the north of that uh, Mirador. Now our project is remote. It's fly in, fly out via an airstrip and of course helicopter access. Uh, but we have excellent access to primary infrastructure here in this area. So the same highway that runs north-south um, and provides access into Mirador and Fruta del Norte also runs by our claims. And in fact, we're working on a joint project with the municipality, uh, which has so far completed the right of way in to connect up our airstrip to the highway grid. And we're in the process of now upgrading 
uh, that right of way with some engineering to allow the passage of vehicles and so on. So that's very important, obviously. But then in addition to that, we've got uh, high tension power lines that are running up and down this, uh, this highway, providing hydroelectric power into the site. And then of course, you've got abundant fresh water as well. So your, your basic pieces of, of, of natural infrastructure uh, are in existence here, which are, are gonna have a very important impact in terms of uh, driving your capital efficiency uh, for this type of you know, large scale project development. And you can see that in evidence at Mirador. Mirador was built 60,000 ton a day open pit for $1.4 billion. You know, the equivalent sort of scale project in Chile, you'd be talking about a $5 billion plus project. Okay, in terms of the history, uh, the copper porphyries discovered in this belt, they all came from uh, a regional program led by David Lowell. This was picking up on work that Billiton had done in the 90s, essentially stream sediment sampling. Uh, David picked, on, picked up on that with more detailed sampling. The actual discovery at Warinsa, which was his top ranked target from this program, was made via prospecting. So he made the discovery at Warinsa Central, did two short drilling campaigns, in total less than 7,000 meters. Uh, of drilling here with a backpack portable rig. And that's, that's the historical database upon which we've defined a, a current, you know, pit optimized uh, resource that we reflect in our disclosure. Uh, social license broke down for David with the indigenous communities that reside on these claims in 2001. And so he moved on to his next target in that program um, at the south end of the belt, 40 kilometers to the south of this, uh, which was Mirador. And he made that discovery later in, uh, in 2001. In terms of our permitting, uh, we've got our reconnaissance um, exploration program. It doesn't, it provides for all the drilling that we currently envision. So we've announced a 40,000 meter program, essentially 40,000 meter holes, which is the kind of meters that we need to fully define uh, the central uh, resource volume or the, the footprint of the central uh, porphyry. Certainly, we can go well beyond that in terms of the number of uh, uh, drilling locations before we start bumping up against the limit of uh, the drilling that's allowed under that permit. We're already in the process of upgrading this to an advanced exploration uh, permit. In terms of the social work, um, obviously a dramatically improved environment uh, for mining and perceptions and sentiments towards mining since the work that Lundin did beginning in 2014 with the Fruity del Norte project, but delivering through the positive headlines and the goodwill uh, and the inclusive approach that they took, particularly in this part of Ecuador, uh, really improving the landscape for, you know, the next series of projects to come through. Um, and so with that, you know, shift in sentiment, we were able to restart a dialogue with the indigenous communities uh, and eventually get to a consensus around the restart of exploration activities. We formalized that in a memorandum of understanding in 2019. That kicked off exploration on the project. And then we've since been able to upgrade that to an impact and benefits agreement, which now covers the full life cycle of the project. So not just the expiration under the MOU, but the full life cycle of the project now under an impact and benefits agreement, which we announced in September. Just skipping over the geology here to look at some of the uh, grade and tonnage profiles of these deposits. So you see at the south end of the belt, Mirador, collectively those porphyries over a billion tons, over 0.6 copper equivalent. Um, so large scale, certainly world class in scale and grade. Um, and then on our flanks, so 15 kilometers on our flanks in Carlos and Panazza, again, if you bring in the inferred, which isn't shown on this slide, you've got over a billion tons uh, open pit a uh, high grade here. So this is an incredibly well endowed belt. I think that Warinza is going to prove to have at least the same sort of potential. Uh, but of course, that's going to require a huge increase in the amount of drilling which we're doing now. So here's the geology here. So you've got a Jurassic Age belt, you've got some volcanics and sediments and then the Batholith uh, rocks, and then a series of uh, porphyries of various uh, age and composition coming through. The earlier porphyries doing essentially ground preparation work, um, and then introducing some of the earlier mineralization, and then a series of mineralizing porphyries. We think at least five mineralizers are coming through here and account for the, the, the large footprint that we see here and the rich grades uh, that we're seeing you know, in drilling. So certainly those factors, together with this being preserved to the top of the, the potassic zone, 
um, with the, the philic and the outer alteration uh, eroded away. And these being, you know, sitting upright and not being faulted and uh, kind of torn apart uh, by deformation in the belt is, is what's accounting for, you know, the kind of footprint and potential that we're seeing here. In terms of the uh, the central zone, so this this resource, um, 124 million tons, pit optimized, 0.7 copper equivalent. Uh, you know the pit shell being less than a one to one strip ratio. This is all based on David Lowell's drilling. You know backpack supported uh, drilling in uh, you know dating back to the early 2000s, less than 7,000 meters in total. You can see the outline of that resource there. It occupies about half of the footprint of the central porphyry. And these footprints, when I, when I speak to footprints, I'm referring to uh, the Molly anomalies. You can see in our drilling um, that the Molly being less mobile in the tropical weathering environment is very consistent from leached, leached, um, leached zone through the supergene enriched and then into the hypogene. Very little difference in terms of the Molly values that you're seeing. And you can see that expressed in these, in these surface anomalies here where they're essentially statistically identical between one another in a geological context within a few ppm uh, between all these different anomalies. Those are essentially the surface expressions of the porphyries, you know, or the weathered expression anyway. Uh, so certainly what we have at central, we'd expect to be able to, uh, uh, you know, kind of duplicate that at, uh, certainly at west and at south and, um, you know, and then east at, as well. There is also gold potential, which I mentioned. These are essentially a, a series of gold anomalies that were identified through stream sediment sampling and then follow up soil sampling last year. The most advanced and the largest of these is, uh, is Kaya. Uh, and I show you in a little bit more detail here on this slide. You can see the stream sediment results and then the soil results. So a typical soil anomaly is, as you guys would well know, you know, you'd be looking for a 50 ppp contour, maybe 100 ppp in a higher value system to define that anomaly. And here we're seeing soil values in excess of 500 ppp, you know, up to 1000 ppp. These are essentially like ore grades that we're seeing in, uh, in, in, in soils. Um, there is no outcrop in this area. So this is sitting down in the valley, approximately 500 meters below the drilling that we're doing at Warrensa Central up on the ridgeline. Um, so you've got to really work to find outcrop. Here's an area that we stripped off the vegetation of uh, down in one of the creek beds. And you can see a sort of a weathered uh, stockwork zone here. So um, there is certainly a juicy um, system in here. We need to add definition to it uh, with the geophysical program, which we're flying now. And once we've added that data uh, together with this soil sampling, I think we're going to be able to have drill targets here and get in and test those with the rig by the end of the year. Um, so there again, central, and then just um, you can see the, the 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 areas that we've drilled. Essentially, the first drilling location on the west side, and then the second drilling location moving to the uh, the east side. Uh, here's what that looks like visually. You can see our drilling camp there in red, and then the uh, and then the actual drilling platform in blue. Those are the results, uh, just spectacular results. Hard to find a comparable for that uh, in any modern exploration that you've seen. So the first hole there, an inclined hole at 80 degrees, uh, we've got um, you know, 567 meters of 1%. This is consistent high grade right the way down the hole from one meter depth. So the high grade is not at the bottom of the hole and being smeared up. It's not in some narrow interval that we're smearing across the interval. It's consistent high grade. The highest values we would have seen would have been 1.2, uh, maybe 1.3% copper in that interval. It bottomed in a barren dike. And so with the second hole, what we attempted to do was avoid that dike and extend the interval. We were successful in doing that and we cut 660 meters of roughly the same sort of grade. Um, so the important thing, obviously, given the early stage of exploration here is pulling out the geological information from the observations we can make in the drill core. We described this as being in the outer halo of the porphyry system. So we're looking at, you know, pyrite values you know, in line with calcopyrite, so transitional from the pyrite shell into the ore shell. Uh, and in terms of alteration, you know, sort of philic alteration, transitional to what we would describe as upper potassic. And so certainly when we get to the core of the mineralization, we're going to expect to see much higher values of calcopyrite than pyrite. We'll expect to see much more intense, you know, kind of core potassic alteration and indeed boronite in place of uh, some of the calcopyrite. We've got evidence that this will be or will have a boronite core to this system. So with the third hole, we stepped out to the other side of the central zone to add deep drilling information in that area. 
you can see the results over a thousand meters bottoming and mineralization uh, with you know very strong grades coming on double the average open pit mine grade last year. Um, still in the outer outer halo. I think it's clear with this drilling that we need to now move to the north as we attempt to triangulate um, and, and sort of tighten the noose on the core of this porphyry system. This is what some of the core looks like, typical porphyry stockwork uh, veining and so on, and then in more detail here. Uh, moving on to west, I just very quickly, I want to finish on, on west here because we are very bullish on the potential that we have at west to identify something similar to central. We actually have stronger values at, at west and then, the, and then the strongest surface values at, in fact, at, at south, which is a little bit more remote for us. There's no outcrop, um, but you can strip off, and we did strip off an area to uncover some of the underlying rocks late last year. And this is the kind of thing that you see. So this is, you know, a chalcosite stock work in here, indicative of the super gene sitting on top of uh, what we expect to be a high-grade porphyry. So we cut a, a channel sample across here in the area that we stripped, and that gave us an open-ended result of 81 meters of 1.1% copper. We've got two platforms set up. Uh, we'll have uh, certainly drilling in into here over the next couple months. And I think with that, I'll just leave it there. That's Warinsa. I hope you enjoyed. Dan, thank you. Um, uh, remarkable.